Hallelujah. Praise Yah. All right, we are up and ready to dig into our study today. We're back into our gospel examinations, looking through what Yahushua is teaching us. And today, we find ourselves at a very pivotal moment in time, if you will. And we're going to learn some more lessons. And some uh, have talked about this already this morning in bits and pieces and it excites me when, you know, the Ruach is stirring and moving as people and we're on one accord as we get into this. So, uh, brother, if you will take us from Matthew nineteen sixteen, and let's go down to number 30, verse 30. So 16 to 30, if you will, this morning. Gotcha. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. And see, one came and said to him, good teacher, what shall I do to have everlasting life? And he said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except one, Elohim. But if you wish to enter into life, guard the commands. Seek, oh, guard the commands. He said to him, which? And Yeshua and Yahushua said, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Respect your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, All of these I have watched over from my youth. What do I still lack? Yahushua said to him, If you wish to be perfect, go. Sell what you have and give to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. And when the young man heard the word, he went away sad, because he had many possessions. And Yahushua said to his taught ones, Truly, I say to you that it is hard for a rich man to enter into the reign of, he of the heavens. And again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the reign of Elohim. Take us down to 30, brother. Oh, I'm sorry. You had the highlight on 24. I apologize. And when his taught ones heard it, they were very astonished, saying, Who then is able to be saved? And looking intently, Yahushua said to them, With men this is impossible, but with Elohim all is possible. And Kepha answering said to him, said, answering said to him, See, we have left all and followed you. What then shall we have? And Yahushua said to them, Truly I say to you, when the son of Adam sits on the throne of his esteem. You have followed me in the rebirth, shall also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. But many who are first shall be last and the last first. Hallelujah. Well, as normal, what do you see here? What's sticking out to you? What's speaking to you this morning? I'm, I've looked often at the whole idea of the, why do you call me good? No one is good except one. And I hear a lot of times in the with the men around me, and I have, you know, for a long time, it's with groups I was involved in through the church and whatnot, you know, it's like we have this idea of, at least for men, we have this idea of, oh, he's a good guy. He's a good guy. And even very early on in my walk, I used to think of this verse. And, I'm, you know, even even Yahushua would say, why do you call me good? No one is good except one. And, I don't know, something always stuck out to me. It's like we have sometimes in our earthly walk, we have this idea of, you know, I got to be good. I got to be good. And there's not any words spoken out of Yahushua's mouth or delivered to one of the prophets from Yahuwah that ever says, and don't forget to be good. And But that's become a common standard anymore and the natural. And that one's always stuck out to me. And this. Yes, for sure. Makes you wonder, you know, in, in, in man's terms, you know, we think we see things in this kind of way, if you will, this structure you know good teacher he he's he's given him a we think we, we, we he's given him a compliment if you will you know when he's saying these things you know good teacher you know what shall i do and and instead of going into the question he makes a correction here which you know 
really makes us look back again at what he says. If he's telling that, if he's saying, why are you calling me good? But there's no one that's good except for Elohim, the father, basically, is what he's saying. Again, he's bringing a separation, a divide between himself and the father. He's bringing a light back to the father. He's redirecting it. You know, you're coming to me because I'm teaching you something and you're calling me good. What does this mean, you know, in, in the sight of man? And what you just said, brother, really encapsulates it because this is kind of the way that we see things. You know, we see things in good and bad, if you will. It, even, but in this sense, you know, he's bringing a correction to something here. Uh, and, and I want to take a look at these highlights uh, of these scriptures that are bringing forth here. Luke 10, 28. Why is it not bringing it up? All right, let me click on it here. Okay. And he said to him, you have answered rightly. Do this and you shall live. John uh, 12, 50. And I know that his commandment is everlasting life. Therefore, whatever I speak as the father has said to me, I speak again, not his own words that he's speaking. These are from the father. You know, Revelation 22, 14, it said, Baruch are those doing his commandments so that the authority shall be theirs unto the tree of life. Again, this is linking us back to the question. And now he's given us a little more answer as we see in other scriptures. That what does it take, you know, to, to have this tree of life, but also the authority that we're seeing here. And he brings it back to the commandments, which as we all know, what's being taught out there in the world is that these things are no longer, that they're done away with, they've been fulfilled. And it's very interesting that we look back here and we see Yahusha, what is he doing? He's bringing us back to, this, to the answer to this question. What do I have to do to have everlasting life? And these here are what he points out. He doesn't say anything. His first words are, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Well, these happen to be the commandments, the very things that reveal us our sin. They reveal that if we're walking in righteousness, these are also the things that are, we're going to be judged according to. Exodus 20, verses 13 and 16 is what he was quoting from here, as well as Deuteronomy 5, 17 through 20. So it brings he's bringing us our focus right back on what's important to the Father. What is it that's going to keep us in, in check and in, in, in alignment and walking on this path that's going to actually get us to everlasting life? And as he's bringing this out, and in this, in this particular account, which we're going to look at Mark and Luke as well, but he gets into a little more detail in this particular one where he actually goes on and he adds something additional, which we see here is, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, which is not quoted in these other verses. And as we see here, it says, do not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the children of your people. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am Yahuwah. So these are commandments that he's bringing our, our focus back to. What's important to the Father? What is, this, what is it that's going to be essential to us getting into eternal life? To be granted this gift. And he brings us, and our focus is right back on the commandments, which are the the, the, the cornerstone, if you will, the foundation of everything that we do is all rooted and grounded around these. So it's very interesting how he's brought these forward and he's speaking to someone that's familiar with these because he has declared that he says, I have watched over from my youth and, 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 and he's doing these things. But then he asked him, what do I still lack then? And what does Yahushua go on to say here, which is kind of a profound statement, you know, if you wish to be perfect, which is an interesting statement, because he wasn't actually asking him about perfection here. In most eyes, people would say, why is he bringing this if you wish to be perfect? Do I have to be perfect to have eternal life? I guess would be the question that would be posed here, according to his statement. And then he goes on and he tells them to sell what you have and give to the poor 
and you shall have treasures in the Shemayim. And then he tells them, come and follow me. Now, these are the footnotes that come from Luke 12, 33. We see this. It says, sell your possessions and give in kindness. Make yourselves purses which do not grow old. A treasure in the Shemayim that does not fail, where no thief does come near nor moss destroy. We also see in Luke 16, verse 9, he says, And I say to you, make friends for yourself by unrighteous, unrighteous mammon, that you fail. They shall receive you into everlasting dwellings. Let's look at Acts 2, 45, and it says, and so, and, and this is kind of an expression of what he's talking about here, is that they, the, the, the disciples, they sold their possessions and, 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 and property, and they divided it among all as anyone might have need. So they're thinking of a community here. So we're looking at what is he telling? What is, the, what is, his, what is his directive here about selling what it is? For In Acts 4.34, for there uh, was uh, not anyone needy among them. For all who were uh, possessors of land or houses sold them, and they, and they brought the price of what they had, was sold, and they shared it amongst the group, if you will, Matthew 6, verse 20. But lay up for yourself treasures in the Shemayim, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. So this is a treasure that's being uh, brought into our lives, if we will, if we see things in the right perspective. This man had lots of wealth, and his, fo his focus, his faith, his trust, was in his wealth. And this is what Yahushua was trying to get to. And, you know, we see scriptures where you can't serve two masters. You know, you're going to love one or hate the other. You're going to serve Yahuwah or, 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 and you're going to hate the other. You can't serve both Yahuwah and Mammon. You know, where is your trust in? So what he's really trying to get to this is, yeah, this this guy has, he's he's held on to these commandments. He's, 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 he's actually put them into his life. But there was something that this man had that he had his trust and his confidence in that would prevent him. Because as we continue to go on here, you know, he talks about why is it so difficult for this man what, or, or for rich, if you will. And it goes on and says, and when the young man heard the words, he went away sad because he had many possessions. He didn't, he what in his heart, his trust and his confidence in his lifestyle and in his life was his possessions, you know, his, his wealth, those things which he had, which gave him comfort in this life. Was he willing to give those up? And it seemed as though that he wasn't. He left. And Yahushua said to his taught ones, truly, I say to you that it is hard for a rich man to enter in to the reign of the Shemayim. Why? He says, because it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the reign of Allahim. Because your trust and your confidence is in your possessions, not in the one that is the giver of the possessions. His, his, your focus is either on the possessions or the one that can give, you know, and trust in the one that can give versus trusting in what you have. Because what you have can be taken. You can't take it with you. So it's interesting how he's brought these into, and, and, and how his disciples, when they heard this, they were astonished and they were saying, well, who then is able to be saved? And the answer is pretty positive here. It says, and in, in, in looking intently, Yahushua said to them, <coughs> he, he gave them this intent look and he's telling them something straightforward. He's saying with men, this is impossible. Why? Because we're trusting in our own abilities, our own strength, our own uh, ability to gain wealth and the things of this life. But with Elohim, all things are possible. So if we trust in him, he is going to be able to deliver us. And the problem is that people can't get past the trusting in him alone. They have been raised to trust in our own skills, our own abilities, the, the trades that we've been raised in, that we've been schooled to do, to, to earn our own income. 
if you look at the way that people live their lives in contrast to what we're reading here, people are not relying on Yahuwah to provide their very substance, their very needs. Therefore, they're looking at their own abilities, their own skills, their own strength, and those things are not going to be able to get you there. They're not going to be able to save you. They're not going to be able to provide for you. It's a hard lesson for us to look at here because people are saying, you mean I got to get rid of everything? This was a lesson for this man that he said that he has done the things that Yahushua had laid out for him as far as the, the Tanakh, you know, the commandments. <clears throat> but there was one thing that he was missing, his trust in the giver of all of these things. He didn't see it in that way, and therefore he was not able to be able to, to see that I could get rid of my, my possessions, my wealth, and rely on Elohim for all things. That's impossible for him, but it's possible with Yahuwah because he is the giver of life. He's the giver of all things. He owns all things, right? So Kepha answers, and he said to him, See, we have left all and followed you. What then shall we have? Now he's asking the question and Yahushua said to him, truly I say to you, when the son of Adam sits on the throne of his esteem, you who have followed him or me in this sense in the rebirth, <clears throat> you shall also sit in thrones. You shall be judging the, the 12 tribes of Yasserel. He's, he's telling you there's something much greater that is going to, be waiting for us when we when we cross over when we enter into the kingdom of of Elohim when we take our positions in that authority that we've been given as the children of Elohim what awaits us our minds can't fathom it we're looking at and holding on to the things of this life as our substance when he should be our very substance is he that should, is the one that we should be focusing on and trusting because when we get to that place where we trust and rely upon him solely for all things, therefore our, our Amuna can therefore believe and trust. And that's what pleases Yahuwah. He's trying to get our, our Amuna and our eyes and our trust upon him instead of our own abilities, our own skills, thinking that we are the ones that are able to provide what's necessary. See, and everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters, or fathers, or mothers, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive a hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. But many who are first shall be last, and the last will be first. More of, of the same type of language that we've heard as we've been studying. You know, those that trust in their own abilities and that, you know, those are the ones that are first in this life. They don't, they're going to come in last in the kingdom because their focus and their trust is in the wrong place. Things are out of order in, in, in their, in their thinking and their abilities. And this also speaks to you and I, as we've had to leave brothers and sisters and fathers and mothers and friends and all of those things that we've talked about so many times as how, you know, there's that division now, you know, they don't see things the same way as you and I do. Their trust and their confidence is in a different Elohim than you and I, you know, their, 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 their trust and their confidence is in a church or, you know, a religion, whatever it might be. He's trying to get us down to the bare bones of what is required of you and I, and that is trust in Elohim alone. That it's him, it's him alone that we trust in our confidence and we rely upon him. And when we can do this, everything happens where now Elohim is able to make things happen. Not only in eternal, but also here, as we're going to see as we continue to, to read. So I'm going to come to the hands and then we're going to go move on to the next version of this uh, so we can see what's being spoken there. Uh, Brother Dean, what you got for us? Shabbat shalom, brother. Shabbat shalom. Um, so, yeah, this uh, I've quoted um, uh, none is good but the Father, you know, none is good but Elohim. So many times in my life, 
uh, um, but even for, should I say, it's, you know, walking, you know, who has me walking in the truth. Um, and um, this is, you know, as you raised one of the ones that, uh, the verses that clearly makes a distinction between who the father is and who the son is, you know? Um, so that, that, that's, it's just something that there's nothing to argue about. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's clear to me, it's clear. Um, hallelujah. But what I wanted to say is, um, is uh, John chapter 6, verse 38. Because I have come down out of the Shamaim, not to do my own desire, but the desire of him who sent me. So when, you know, when, when in, in response to uh, none is good, but, you know, uh, but, but, but Abba, none is good, but Yahuwah, um, that he, he uh, Yahuwah, is walking and living in uh, operating in obedience you know um and i think this is a, a you know when they're speaking about being good or bad and he, and he's trying to teach them about the uh the he's almost like giving them a cheat code in reference to what your life will be like if you choose obedience over good and bad you know um because you no longer have to consider is it good or is it bad because you know who where your obedience is in like it, it's when you're living a life of obedience and you know who is teaching you and and what you're obeying and who you, whom you're obeying um that's what the scripture says obedience is greater than sacrifice you know people can make good decisions and bad decisions but obedience is obedience you know um and also um when it speaks about the the you know the, the rich man the scripture says in first john chapter 2 verse 15 do not love the world, nor that which is in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So the more you have, the more, you know, the more you have and the longer you have it for or the longer you pine for it, um, it's harder to let it go, you know, and, and, and worse when it begins to become uh, your status, your reputation, it be when it becomes your identity, when it's a part of that which become is your identity, that in itself is, is stealing from the identity of, you know, the, the resurrected, the, the new creation that, you know, that we have access to through Yahusha. So, yeah, um, that was that was what I wanted to say there. Hallelujah. It's interesting as we look at these scriptures, how they remind us and how they pull us back to other portions of scripture. Like I was saying, as you guys were speaking, you know, this lesson, it was permeating in my mind and you guys are speaking as though you already were aware, you know, uh, just through your ordinary words or your choices, you know, and now we see these things being dealt with. And I think that it's very profound as we, as we look at, you know, these scriptures and, you know, when we think about, you know, good, when somebody in, in our own humanly ways, you know, you know, he's a good man, like you said, or a good person, but what does that really mean? You know, what does that mean in the sense of, do you really know who this person is just because they do maybe some good deeds, you know? Uh, you see them through a light, but you don't know that person and how good, if you want to put them in the term of good, when, when Yahushua says, there ain't none good, not one. So is that a term that we should get out of our vocabulary as judging somebody as being good or, or, you know, in that sense, because, you know, if, if he's, he's putting a clamp on that, he's like, well, wait a minute, hold on a minute. You calling me good? You would think Yahushua is good, right? I mean, that would be a thought. But he's saying, no, not even me. I'm not even good in this sense. There's only one that's good, and that's the Father. And I think that that's very interesting how he redirected that. And he's putting a check in our minds of how we look at good and bad, if you will. You know, in this sense, we see that if we're looking at it in, in that sense, I want to look at that word real quick in, in uh as far as good and to see what it really was speaking of. And, you know, it really isn't anything off kilter, if you will. Uh, let me just go here real quick and, and tell you what that word actually means. Um, I just had it where to go. Oh, here it is. Uh, so G18 and that word uh, good 
in any sense, often as a noun, meaning a benefit, a good, uh, as in good things, uh, well, as well as it's compared to the G2570. So in the sense of, of you and I's uh, revelation of what we believe is a good and bad when we're, when we're kind of weighing things, if you will, you would think that Yahushua would be in that category of good, but he's, he's even making that known that he's not even in that classification, which is kind of baffling because I would think if you would take a, a poll of any believer and you ask, is Yahushua good? Is the Messiah good? Everybody would say yes. But his own words, he's he's kind of putting a check on that. Why you call me good? That's that's a that's a revelation that we need to ponder on a bit, because our our vision or our view, if you will, of what we perceive as good in Yahuwah's eyes is not. You know, um, so we got some hands up. I want to get to them before we move on, but some good points here for us to look at. Uh, brother Charles, what you got? Shabbat shalom, brother. Shabbat Shalom. Um, so that verse, um, verse 23 and 24, you know, um, this, this, this is some, you know, it's, it's going to be easier for a camel to um, squeeze through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to go in. That's a real small, small, slim chance, man. It's almost no chance, you know? So why uh, bank on your riches? And, you know, um, what what this make me think of is um like in Ecclesiastes five fifteen. Well, I'll start at fourteen. Ecclesiastes five fourteen. When when what better person to let you know than um than Solomon, right? He says, But those riches perish through misfortune. When he begets a son, there is nothing in his hand. As he came from his mother's matrix or womb, naked shall he return to go to go as he came, and he shall take nothing from his labor, which he may carry away in his hands. And this is letting you know, man, you know, you came here with nothing, as they say, and you leave here with nothing. So, and you know, the, the best thing I, I learned in life, why I can't apply this, that when you let go of stuff, if you really let go, you you see he he starts to work, and it's hard for me to, um get back to that sometimes and I, I just want to make that confession but the the next correlation I want to get um to is first Timothy 6 verse 6 and 7 you can actually go down to 10 but I'll just read 6 to 7 I mean 6 to yeah 8 first Timothy 6 6 says now goodliness with contentment is great gain for we brought nothing into this world and it is certain we can carry nothing out and having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. But those who desire to, to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which draw men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed away from the faith and their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So that's why I want to say, you know, um, let it go. Praise you Makes you think about things, don't it? You know, the other thing that really sticked out to me here that, uh, that I didn't point out is uh, in verse 21, where, where he's speaking here, he says, and you said to him, if you wish to be perfect, interesting choice of words here. If you wish to be perfect, go and sell what you have and give it to the poor. Now, this is a, taking us to a level of perfection. And, and when we're looking at, you know, some examples of, of what we're looking at here about this, you know, it, it takes me to uh, back to Genesis where, you know, uh, in 6, 9, it says, these are the generations uh, uh, of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generation, and Noah walked before Elohim. Um, and again, it says it again in Genesis 17, 1, it says, and when Abram was 90 years old and, and nine, so 99 years old, uh, Yahuwah appeared to, to Abram, and he said unto him, I am the almighty Elohim. Walk before me and be you perfect. 
So this is another uh, another area for us to hone in on is, you know, this is a this is a perfecting thing that he's telling him. You know, he's taking him to a whole nother level uh, or another degree of understanding about what it takes. What is and and what is what is selling your possessions have to do with being per- perfected? That would be my question that I that I pose from this by, you know, how does uh, selling your possession and giving it to the poor bring you to perfection or make you more perfect, if you will, in your walk? And it's, uh, I believe a lot of it has to do with now you're taking it to a level of your trust is in your possessions and to your riches. And if you take those and you, and you sell that and you use that money to help the needy, the poor, you're taking your eyes off of your possession. You're putting your eyes on those that are in need. So you're able to help others with your possessions, which is, is taking you to another level of perfection in Yahuwah's kingdom. Because his concern, his care is always about the widows and the orphans. That was what the purpose of, of why he did the things that he did with Yasserel, you know, setting up the, the ties and the storehouse and that so that, you know, and telling the, that you're not to, you know, uh, harvest all the way to the ends or of, of the of your fields, that you're supposed to leave some for, for the needy and the widows and the orphans so that everyone's needs are taken care of. Yahuwah's cares are beyond your riches, but he is, his cares and his concern is about his children, his people that they're taking care of. And so therefore, by going and doing these things, you're taking your, 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 your covetousness, if you will, which is, wasn't even actually uh, mentioned by him in these, but he's alluding to the commandments, which actually covers covetousness, you know, and having the willingness to be able to surrender the things that you have in your life to help somebody else. Interesting perspective as we look at these things. Michael and Deanna, what you got for us morning? Shabbat Shalom, it's Deanna. Um, I, um, Brother Rick, that's exactly what I was kind of um, thinking myself is that, um, you know, he was keeping all those six through 10 commandments, but he was not, I think that the story for me points out that he wasn't keeping the first, which is to love Yahuwah with all your heart, your soul and your might, because he wasn't. And to me, what I was speaking is that he wasn't trusting that Yah could provide, like, you know, sell everything and then trust that, that he can provide and that he's enough. And when I was looking up the word perfect um, in the Greek telios, it means complete. And so like to me, that really helps me because I'm only complete because Yahuwah completes me. And so, which means he will provide for everything. And it's not about anything that I have or don't have. It's just, can I walk in obedience? And so I just, I just wanted to share that, but you kind of already hit on that point, but yeah, he was keeping all these parallel, you know, horizontal commandments, but he was missing the first and most important. And I keep reflecting on if I, I mean, have I really, have I really walked out that first commandment today or, you know, help me to walk out because when I can walk that out, all the others will flow. But I mean, I really, do I really grasp that? And it just returned me back to the first commandment. That's all. Praise yeah. Hallelujah. And it should bring us our attention back to that one. You know, that's the one, the greatest commandment is love your Allahim. And I think that's what he's really bringing us back to is this focus on, you know, he didn't, he didn't mention the first four, which is kind of interesting or the last one, but he brought our attention to how we love, how we interact with our brothers and our sisters, our neighbors, you know, how we take care of one another as a family of, of believers. You know, this is where he's bringing us back to. If you think about the, the things that he spoke about, you know, and what he's telling us here to do is to care for, you know, those, it, it, it really does bring our focus all the way back into the, the whole scope of, of it all. It all matters, you know. And I, I really find it is interesting that he brought our attention back to the commandments when asked about this, because that really settles the matter about, you know, some of the areas of what it's going to require for us to get into the Shemayim or, or to eternal life, if you will. You know, we have to keep a focus on all aspects of these things and not one of these 
are, are less important than the other. And he brings our attention right back to what was asked of Yahusha. What's the greatest of these commandments? Well, if it's if it happens to be love Yahuwah, that that's speaking to what, what you're talking about. You know, but then also to love your neighbor as yourself. And that's really what he's focusing on here is my treasures could be used to help the whole of the body. You know, and if I was to, if I wanted to be perfect or made perfect, my mind would be transformed into thinking about how I can use my riches to help others and then trust that you who is going to continue to sustain me and provide you know, which is a whole nother level. That's a level of a Muna trust that you got to have in him. And that comes through the relationship and walking this out. Hallelujah. Sister Alexandria, good morning. Shabbat Shalom. Good morning again, Elder Rick. Shabbat Shalom. And um, I'm just so uh, enjoying this discussion on the perception of what is good. And I was just thinking about um, how Kepha is rebuked by Yahusha. Um, you know, Yahusha is always continuously reminding us to be careful in what we try to determine in our own will or outside of the Father what is good. Um, and we have to be careful because Kepha was trying to tell Yahusha, and this was Matthew 16, 21, you know, when Yahusha was saying, you know, that he was going to have to, you know, suffer and these things were going to happen. And he, Kepha thought he was being good by saying, no, Yahusha, no, this is not going to happen. And Yahusha had to rebuke him because Kepha didn't have an understanding of the greatness of what was going to come from what Yahusha was going to suffer and do for us. Um, so I, I just find this so interesting in that. And I, um, I go back to what you were saying earlier about um, why would Yahusha... Um, only say that the father is good. And I think that Yahusha would not dare give praise to himself and, and bring it back to the father that he is, he is good. He is the good. He is the most high. So only the father is good. But Yahusha didn't say that he was, he just said, hey, and also to remind us, hey, be careful on who you try to think and say is good because you know, you don't know that person. You don't know the will or that spirit of that person. But the Father, the Father is the only one that is good. So hallelujah and thank you. Hallelujah. As you were speaking about Kepha, it took me back to what he asked here. You know, and, and when and Kepha, and this is after he's talking about, you know, that he needs to go sell everything, you know, and and. I guess it comes in at right around 25. He says, and when his taught ones heard it, they were astonished. So they're hearing this and they're astonished by saying, who then is able to be saved if this, if this is required of you? And now and now he goes on, goes on in his next question here. Um, after Yahushua says that with men it's impossible, but Yahuwah, everything is possible. He says, okay, we have left all and we've followed you. What then shall we have? We don't have anything because we've get, we surrendered it all. We've given it all up. And Yahushua answers, there's something greater awaiting for you. He says, truly, I say to you, when the son of Adam sits on the throne of his esteem, you who have followed me in the rebirth, you know, your immersion, your rebirth into him, into his life, he's given you authority. He's given you a place in his kingdom where you're going to be sitting beside him on the throne judging that's that's the place of, of, of honor, of esteem that he's trying to get our minds to see. And we have something greater ahead of us, a greater place that we're at, at a greater level, uh, if you will. When we get to the other side, when we get to the kingdom of Elohim, there's something greater waiting for us in this eternal life. So the things of this world, this of this life, shouldn't have such uh, pull on you, such control of your life. You should be able and willing to give as you've been, as you've received. It should be a free will thing. It shouldn't be something where we're hoarding all these things and we're taking them into our own possession, if you will. We're holding on, we're clutching them because these are the things that we believe are sustaining us in this life. Our riches, uh, you know, our jobs, those kind of things all come to my mind where he's saying those things really have no relevance <clears throat> when it comes to the kingdom of Elohim. 
You know, even the things of, of this earth that you're going to possess can be amplified when we surrender it all. He can give us all. But as long as we continue to hold on to anything in this life, we're, 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 we're being separated or disconnected, if you will, from the things of Elohim and what he has in store for us, not only just in eternity, but also here while we're still here, you know. What we what we perceive as, as something that's cherished or that's important to us, such as our riches, he can give us something that's even greater than that. While Brother Ricky, if I may, I just wanted to also go back to the, the possession thing. Kefa, thank goodness for Kefa and his mistakes because it gives me hope in my mistakes. <laughs> because hallelujah to be, you know, able to be forgiven. But he brought up, I wonder if uh, Yahusha is speaking to Kepha about possessions because Kepha was in a, in essence, kind of talking about Yahusha as a possession and not wanting to let him go when he said that, what was going to happen to him in Jerusalem. And yes, to your point, Yahusha is saying, oh, you know, I have to rebuke you. You don't understand these, me in this world is not going to save you. I have to leave, you know, all of the things in this world, we have to be ready to let it go, including the Yahushua's presence in this world. That's what he was saying, I think, his physical presence, I should say. But yes, letting go of possessions is a hard thing for our flesh. Hallelujah. Thank you. That's all I want to say. Thank you. It is hard for our flesh, you know, um, especially when you come up in, in hard times and you finally get some things in your life those things become really treasured to you, you know, in our own minds, you know, we think that kind of way. And he's trying to adjust our thinking that the things of this life aren't that really that important. You know, the lives of the, of your fellow brother and sister are more important, you know, be mindful of them. You know, your positions, uh, you're, you're going to be taken care of. You know, you have the provider, you have ac direct access to them. And you don't think that he has care for you, that he, you know, his scripture tells us that he has more, more care and more concern than, than the birds, you know, that he provides a place for them. How much greater is it, you know, that he's going to take care of you and I, you know, he provides for all his creation and praise Yah that he, you know, that he's getting our minds to a place where we're looking at what's important. We're focusing on the matters that are important to him and his kingdom because we are heirs of his kingdom, you know? Uh, so we should start thinking in that kind of a sense, you know, and get off of this earthly realm thinking, if you will, and start thinking in, a, in another dimension, if you will, you know, in the Shemayim realm, you know, what's being stored up for us, you know, th this is something that, you know, that we have to look forward to. And these are promises that he's given us as well. Sister Rachel, good morning, Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat shalom. Um, I really appreciate this teaching and thank you once again um, for like the words and encouragement. Um, I think one of the things that really stuck out to me was like the contrast between um, being in a state of poverty versus being rich. You know, like there's an external factor where you have all this wealth and all this greatness, but internally it's like you're broken down, you have a broken spirit, you're selfish, you have pride. And versus someone who's in poverty state, well, externally, you know, it might not look best in their situation, but internally, they have wealth inside of them. And I think that's what's um, interesting because, you know, you look at the heart and the heart of the matter, like what you're harboring in your heart. Um, there's just, it's, it's like really interesting because like, you know, the Messiah pulls about to say, um, you know, like where treasure is, your heart will be also. And it's just, I have so many interesting correlations because um, it's just so many things come to mind. But uh, there was like another thing I want to speak about. Um, just got to find the verse. Um, uh, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, so I think, yeah, I'll just say that, but I'll, I'll, I'll kind of from the verse. Well, I think you're, you're probably re referencing Luke 12, 34, where it says, where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. 
Yeah, yeah, I, I think that was already. I don't know if that was in writing or in the verse, but yeah, similar to that. But um, Shabbat Shalom. Thank you. Hallelujah. Well, that's that's true. Uh, in this in this uh, in this discussion, that fits perfectly because it's telling us where is your where your treasure is. So where is your treasure? What is your treasure? Because that's where your heart's going to be. Whatever it is that you're treasuring, what you put that high value on guess what? That's where your heart is too. So if your heart is attached to your riches, you can't have your heart also in the hands or of the father, right? You know, your heart, that's where he's trying to get us. We have to have uh, our, our eyes, our, our attention, our desires should be focused in the right place with the right understanding. Therefore, if we're putting our hopes and our confidence into our treasures of this life, that's where our heart's going to be. Therefore, our hearts are going to be separate from the Father as well. Because he tells us that we can't serve both, Mammon and Yahuwah. So it's interesting how this is coming together to see so much more involved. You know, you got pride, you got arrogance, you got greed, you got all these different aspects that are underlying issues that are still here as well that I think may have some barrier on what uh, what this uh what Yahushua was kind of bringing to light, you know, you think about this man and he's looking at his riches because he got great riches. He's asking, how do I get to eternal life? Because evidently that's something that's on his mind as well. But after he heard what's required of him, did he just walks away saddened because now he's got to choose between eternity and his riches here. What, what's more important? And evidently his riches became more important to him at that time. That he walked away, and he was sad. Ben and Jamie, what you got? Shabbat shalom. Good morning. Shabbat shalom, brother Rick. Um, I think for me, the best way that I can look at this is <laughs> as simplistic as I can possibly make it. So, like, what is good and bad, right? Who's um, whose scale are we looking at when we judge what's good and bad? I mean, as as the enemy has continued over the centuries to change the minds of the people and to to make their desires and their their wants and their doctrines more aligned with him and his ways um in my old walk i noticed that what i thought was good and bad what i thought was righteous or an abomination was my opinion was was the things that men had taught me was um what what is quote good or bad um, the only scale in all of this that matters when we measure good or bad, when we measure what's righteous or an abomination is the father's. And as I've been trying to learn his ways and implement them in my life, the thing that I look at and that I notice is that people who I thought loved the father, who I thought were, or who I would have considered quote, good people, um, they're not submitting to him at all. And I don't mean that like they just don't know. So I'm not saying that like as if I'm better than anyone, but I realize as I, as I'm learning his ways, I have no idea what good and bad is until I put my focus on his word and on his ways. And even then, like I'm, I'm looking back at, at the way I used to walk and I, and I thought I was following him because I, I had so many lies that, that I had accepted. And the thoughts of men's hearts are only evil continually. The thought of the thoughts of my heart were only evil continually. And it wasn't until the Ruach stepped in and started helping me to overcome those sins that I had any idea of what good and bad, if you even want to use those words, or or what righteous and an abomination is to the Father until I understood how he was measuring things and praise Yah that he has showed us that. You said a, a mouthful there, sister, um, right on point. You know, we can't judge good and bad when we don't understand the depths of good and bad. What classifies somebody as good you know, in this sense, he didn't really say anything about bad, but, you know, he's emphasizing on you're, you're, you're speaking about good. You really don't know what you're saying. 
because there's only one that's really good. So what you just said is, is so important there that we keep that in focus is that, you know, the father, his word and his ways is, is what deems as good. And that we should keep our focus on that. We should keep our desires on pursuing that and implementing that into our lives. Hallelujah. Brother Dean, what you got, Shalom. brother? Shalom. Um, so speaking about the rich man and, and letting and his countenance at the thought of letting go. Um, and this just, you know, it just brings me back to this thing again about obedience. And um, then it brings me back to Yahuwah and what is, you know, him showing through his love what he's prepared to do um, for the thing, you know, for the, for the one that he loves, you know, the most, <laughs> you know. And John 3.16 says, for Elohim so loved the world that he gave his only brought forth son so that everyone who believes in him should not perish but possess everlasting life so the idea when he's saying you know hey so you know you, you've got a couple of um grains of sand that you call a desert of wealth you know an ocean of wealth um you're gonna have to discard that and 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 now you know the, the heart is troubled now the heart is you know feeling robbed you know so um and then it go um speaking about the difference between one who is following but then when it comes to um, following in reference to their comfortability as opposed to following because um, in, un, under the uh, full notion of a be of an obedient heart yeah we go to uh genesis 22 um, um i'll just read a little bit of it i'm sure there's too much of it for me to do but um, um um and it says and it came to be after so firstly little backstory i'm sure everyone knows you know um abraham was quite old you know um if, that, if that's the correct understanding and his son uh is isaac yep so this is his son this is his, he's pined for this son yep um and now it says and it came to be after these events that elohim tried abraham so sometimes the thing the possessions that we have will be the area in which we will be tested and if you know if we don't understand that then we will look we'll pray for a test to pass like give me another trial yahuwah uh, and while i hold on to this thing that i asked you to bless me with and you blessed me so this can't be a part of the trial can it <laughs> okay so hallelujah and it came to be after these events that El elohim tried abraham and said to him abraham and he said here i am mm, that's a big thing um, and he said, take your son now, your only son, Yitzhak, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as an ascending offering on one of the mountains which I command you. And Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Yitzhak, his son. And he split the wood for the ascending offering and arose and went to the place which Elohim had commanded him. And on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place from a distance. So Abraham said to his son, said, said to his young men, stay here with the donkey while the boy and I go over there and worship and come back to you, worship. And Abraham took the wood of the ascending offering and laid it on Yitshak his son and he took the fire in his hand and a knife and the two of them went together so he's walking in obedience he's not questioning anything and Yitshak spoke to Abraham his father and said my father and he said here I am my son and he said see the fire and the wood but where is the lamb for an ascending offering and Abraham said my son Elohim does provide for himself the lamb for an ascending offering and the two of them went together just to interject there's they're the greatest emotional attachment he could have is to his son but when it comes to the obedience to yahuwah he doesn't allow for his emotional attachment to uh cloud the obedience of of, of the commandments that he's been given um and they came to the place which elohim had commanded him and abraham built a slaughter place there and placed the wood in order and he bound Yitzhak, his son, and laid him on the slaughter place. 
upon the wood and Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son but the messenger of Yahuwah called him from the Shamaim and said Abraham Abraham and he said here I am and he said do not lay your hand on the boy nor touch him for now I know that you fear Elohim seeing you have not withheld your son your only son from me and Abraham lifted his eyes and looked and saw behind a ram caught in a bush by its horn, by its horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for an ascending offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Yare, um, Yahuwah Yare, as it is said to this day on the mountain Yahuwah provides. This is what we have to remember, Yahuwah provides. And the messenger of Yahuwah called Abraham a second time from the Shamaim and said, by myself I sworn, by myself I have sworn, declares Yahuwah, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, that I shall certainly bless you and I shall certainly increase your seed as the stars of the Shamaim, as the sand which is on the seashores and let your seed possess the gate of their enemies and finally and in your seed all nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice just like what we read today when you shared that the position that they will hold is that they will be uh, seated upon thrones and that they shall judge yashrael so you know it's a complete it's it's beyond our comprehension the level of you know uh of, of what he has in store for, for, for those who live a life of obedience. It's different. So, hallelujah. Great story example in this because it does bring us back. That was his treasure. That was one thing that he treasured most of all is his son that he was given at such an old age that he trusted and he, he endured so long to receive and then he had to be to a place where he was willing to surrender and let that go. It does correspond so well to this story today in the treasures of our possessions. Are we willing to surrender them because you who has given them to us and trust that he will, he will provide either way, you know, what made him perfect in that example, which I used earlier as a, as an example of perfection is that he was willing to, to trust no matter what it didn't matter if you who had just gave him his son that he was willing to give him back if you if you have these uh in this story that we have today this man was not willing to give up what he had even though he held to the commandments he held to those things through his life there was one thing that would have made him perfect according to what yahushua said and he wasn't willing to do that in contrast to what you use with Abraham. Abraham was willing because he trusted that if Yahuwah gave him this son, that he was willing to raise him back up or give him, you know, that again. So there's a place in that story that we have to find ourselves in as well, that we trust Yahuwah no matter what he desires for us to give up, to surrender to him, that there's nothing that should stop us our riches, even our children at that point. There should be nothing to stop us from trusting and doing whatever it is that he's leading us to do. And in the end, he made it known that, you know, because of his obedience, his willingness to give, he didn't, he wasn't going to take him and he provided a, a, an alternate sacrifice for that purpose, for that setting. And he'll do the same, I believe, in this kind of a setting, if we will just loose our hearts and hold nothing in this life as cherished to the point where we won't surrender it to your father. If he tells us to do something, we should be willing to let it all go and surrender it all and to do what he says. Because we don't know what his plan is on the other side. What is it he's going to re, uh, that he's going to replace it with? He's already given us one example of the reward that's waiting for us, which is in the Shemayim you know, our position in his, in his kingdom. But what is he going to willing to do for us while we're here in this life, if we're willing to let it all go and there's nothing that we aren't willing to hand a hand right back to him and say, here, your will be done. Father, this is a great lesson for us. This is a story that's hard for people to look at because they, they see that he's telling them, I got to give up all my stuff 
and come follow you. And he's and we've we've seen this not only in one place in scripture. The same example has been given to us multiple times in scripture, where the same place or the same uh, thing is posed to him. What are you going to do? What are you willing to do? And this is where we need to be in our lives, where we're walking, where there's nothing that's treasured or cherished more than him and his will for our lives. So praise you for this, uh, this example that we have today. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and continue to move on. Brother Dean, since you're up and you were the second one that had your hand up, let's move on to uh, Mark uh, Mark 17, and let's take it down to 31. Let me go ahead and share this so that we can see it. And if you will, brother. Shalom. So is that Mark 17, verse 1, 2, 31? Sorry, Elder Rick, I didn't hear what you said. Oh, I'm sorry, I did have my milk. Uh, Mark 10, 17 to 31. Mark 10, 17 to 31. No problem. Okay. Okay. Well, where are we there? Sorry, apologies. Uh, Mark. 10, 17 to 31. Okay. Hallelujah. And as he was setting out on the way, one came running and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit everlasting life? And Yahusha said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except one, Elohim. You know the commands. Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not rob, respect your father and your mother. And he answering said to him, teacher, all these I have watched over from my youth. And Yahusha, looking at him, loved him and said to him, one matter you lack, go sell all you possess and give to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me, taking up the stake. But he, being sad at this word, went away grieved, for he had many possessions. And Yahusha, looking around, said to his taught ones, How hard it is for those who have money to enter into the reign of Elohim. And the taught ones were astonished at his words. And Yahusha responding said to them, Again, children, how hard it is for those who trust in riches to enter into the reign of Elohim. It is easier for a camel to enter through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the reign of Elohim. And they were imme immeasurably astonished, saying among themselves, who then is able to be saved? And looking at them, Yahusha said, With men it is impossible, but not with Elohim. For with Elohim all is possible. And Kepha began to say to him, See, we have left all, and we have followed you. Yahusha said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house, or brothers, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for the sake of me and the good news, who shall not receive a hundredfold, how in this time, now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come everlasting life. But many who are first shall be last and the last first. Hallelujah. What's different in this account? Anything sticking out to you that's uh, the speaking? Anything different than what we've talked about in Matthew? Um, I think um, there was something. Um, so, sorry, just, just to add quickly, um, uh, Yahuwah says clearly that he's no man's debtor. 
Um, so when it's speaking about, you know, the things that we may feel that we have left and, you know, sacrificed. Um, so he's making it clear here. Um, he's making a reward clear here. Yeah. Um, when he's speaking about receiving a hundredfold. So he, he, he's giving, he's giving, um, in, you know, understanding that it, it's, it's not a mystery. It's not all left as a mystery. There is a reward. Um, and so, you know, yeah, there's a reward. Um, and also, uh, no, yeah, just again, it comes, it's, he's, for me personally, not saying it sticks out anymore, but just again, for those who say the law is done away with, you know, um, the fact that um, he says in order for, you know, not sorry, in, in order for, for you to basically follow and, and, and you know, live the life that Yahuwah desires of you, you literally have to, uh, you have to obey the commandments. So, uh, yeah, I'm just perplexed as to how any person who, who, who claims that they believe on Yahusha um, can separate Yahusha from the, from, you know, from Torah. I, 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 yeah, so, yeah, that, that much. That's all I can say here. Hallelujah. Yeah, it's pretty hard to separate him from the Torah, that's for sure. When he is essentially the Torah, you know. Uh, um, another thing here that stuck out to me as you were reading this, which is not anything different, there was, um, but it goes into a little more detail, uh, and it goes into uh, in verse twenty-one where it, 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 he's talking about uh, as Yahusha looking at him loved him, and he said to him. One matter you lack, go sell all your possessions and give it to the poor, and you shall have the treasures in the Shemayim, and come and follow me. And here he says, take up your stake. Uh, you know, this is another one of those things that goes into a little more depth about one more level of what he's asking for us to go and, and walk is not only to do these things, but also to pick up our stake. Uh, do the same things that, that he had to endure. We're going to endure some difficulties in this life, some trials, some tribulations, as we've read earlier, that Yahuwah will possibly even bring to us to be able to try and test us where we stand. Um, <clears throat> and the other thing that I, that I found that I thought was pretty interesting here, uh, where was it at here? Oh, it, it, and it goes back to, and, they, and it was said earlier too, um, in verse 26, and they were immeasurably astonished, saying among themselves, who then is able to be saved? It takes us to the question about being saved. What does that really reference? What does that mean? Uh, when we're thinking about the story here is founded around eternity, you know, what's ahead. And, you know, I know within the church, you know, there's a, this thing about being saved, you know, but what are we saved from or what are we, what is the sa saved about, you know, and in this context, it, you know, it brought me back to that question. Once again, when he's, when he's asking that question, who, who then can be saved, saved from these lives? If we can't surrender the possessions that we have, and this is one of the things that, that would uh, stop us or prevent us would be our possessions then, you know, he goes on and he says, with men, it's impossible. So this tells us a whole other thing, that we need Elohim to help us to make this possible. Because some of these things are going to be so difficult for you and I that we're not going to be able to do it on our own. You know, we're going to have to have assistance from the Father. So with the Father, these things that are asked of us are possible. But our hearts have to be in the right places. We have to have a, a, a surrendered heart and mind, uh, uh, willing to 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 do what is required of us to walk in a certain way. You know, if we're asked to do something, like you just used, uh, uh, you know, Abraham and Isaac as an example, that was one. That was his great treasure that you know that Yahuwah had just given him. But he he was he he believed that Yahuwah was asking him to 
to, to, to sacrifice him. And he very well could have. But I believe that, it, and he may have if, 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 you know, if Abraham had to come with a different kind of attitude. Well, you just gave him to me. I'm not going to, I'm not going to sacrifice him. You know, he could have had all kinds of different uh, responses, but his was, okay, I trust you. If you gave him to me, I'm going to tell, trust whatever you tell me to do with him. And that's powerful in, the, in, in realm to this story here that we have. If we can sync them together and see that there's no possession, because I don't know about you, my my riches or, or or the money that I have do not compare to my child or my my family. Those are more cherished by me than than any money could be. So I would be more willing to give up my money than to surrender a child. So when you start putting those two together, if he asks you to do it, you got to be. Are you willing to do whatever he asks you to do? Because it's it's impossible for man, but it's possible for Allahim. He can do all things. So. We got to keep that in mind. Marquez family, what you got? Shabbat shalom. Uh, yes, brother. You know what? I just, uh, I had a couple of things coming to mind and I don't, I just wanted to bring it up to see if, um, you know, if I'm correlating those things right. But Philippians 4.11, you know, where brother Shaul talks about, he's learning, he's our, he's learned how to be content. And whatever state that he's in and that helped that came to mind at first when you when we started the lesson and I started thinking you know because he knew or he had that understanding and realization like this rich man was missing that if we have yah we already have everything that we need you know we don't we're really not in need of anything if we have him that's the the greatest thing that we could have. And then secondly, um, was in first John two, three. Um, and again, if I'm not, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, brother, I, this is just something that was coming to mind. Um, and it says really the entirety of the chapter, but, um, starting at two, three, it says, and by this, we know that we know him if we guard his commands. The one who says, I know, does not guard his commands is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever guards his word, truly the love of Elohim has been perfected in him. And by this, we know that we are in him. So, I mean, it says that, you know, if we don't love, if we don't keep his commandments, we don't really love Yah in the first place. And going back to with many people, you know, that come up and, you know, to my husband, I guess he'd be the best example. And, you know, that's the biggest thing is, um, like Brother Dean was saying, too, you know, always bringing up that we're done with the law, you know, that that's been put away and, you know, we're by under we're under grace now and things like that. And so there's really just like a whole a whole bigger picture that Yah is really trying to tie in and and show us. Hallelujah. I think you're you're in the right mindset of what you're seeing, you know. Um, all of those examples that you gave are, you know, I think in great alignment with what we're looking at here. And it's it really comes down to our hearts, you know, and, you know, our trust in the Father, you know, as our provider, as Yaira, you know, you know, he, he's a provider. And if we do really truly believe that, then surrendering anything shouldn't really be that hard you know once you get to a place of trusting in him you know all of these different matters come up well if you're asking me to do something then i guess that's necessary you know but if you if you don't see it in that sense and it's a like almost a burden to say wow like this rich man you know i mean he 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 had everything except for one thing that he had to do to be perfected. He was keeping the commandments, as as you alluded to. Uh, actually, both of you guys are alluding to, you know, the the importance of the commandments. There's a reason that Yahusha brought them back out when he was asked this question, and those are the things that he gave. You know, are the commandments. I don't see how we can't you know see that and and have that affect us in in our decisions going forward, no matter what is required of us 
like you said, we got to trust that he is our provider and that, you know, he's not going to ask us to do anything that's going to harm us, but it's going to benefit us. It's, it's going to, it's going to prove to you and I where we stand in this walk with him, you know, and that does a lot for you and I, because now we can see just like Abram or Abraham, you know, he was in the position where he trusted Yahuwah. He was called a righteous man because he trusted what Yahuwah said, you know, and then to be asked to give up your, your son. That's what it appeared to be anyways, when it, when it first started. And, and that's the way he perceived it and he walked, but he trusted it no matter what. Yahuwah was in control and uh, it was possible with him. Alexandria. What you got, sister? Yes, I just wanted to read scripture. Um, uh, Philippians 2, verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is Yahuwah which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And I just also wanted to, um, I mean, that says everything to me there. Um, Brother Dean bringing up um, um, Abraham and uh, his obedience to the father um, to take Isaac to be sacrificed. I find it so very interesting to hear that the, the people that the father calls to, and they immediately say, here I am, Samuel, here I am. I wonder if it's here, comma, I am. I, it's just it's so, something interesting there in that, but they immediately are obedient and answer and let the father know. It's not like the father doesn't know where they are. He wants to hear how they will respond to him. And then I just wanted to go back to, uh, what you were, uh, the scriptures you were reading in Mark. And um, yes, the, I find that so beautiful how um, Mark perceives Yahusha's love and responding to the, 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 the youth who asked the question and he is saying, and he's loving him. He's loving him as he is asking this question. And, but what really strikes me is that he says, follow me and take up your stake. And that is the only way to die to these possessions. These aren't possessions, aren't just things. Yes, they're feelings, they're people, they're emotions that we carry, but dying in Yahusha is the only way that we are going to be able to. And I say that with great humbleness because my flesh, I think on these things that are dear to me and wow, to let them go. Abraham, you know, fear and trembling, how he walked in obedience to what the father asked. I mean, to walk in obedience. That is the only way to do that is to follow Yahusha, Yahuwah, and die in Yahusha. But wow, what that means, what that means. And so um, praise Yahuwah. Hallelujah. Thank you. Praise Yah for his deep revelations. Hallelujah. I'm going to come to you, Ben and Jamie. I see you, but I want to get uh, to Luke version and real quick. And I'll go ahead and read this. This is, this is a little bit shorter than the others. And uh, let's see what, you know, what we see here. It says, and a certain ruler asked him saying, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit everlasting life? So Yahushua said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except one, Alahim. You know the commands, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, respect your father and your mother. These are what we see in Exodus 20, 12 through 16, as well as Deuteronomy 5, verses 16 and 20. And he said, all of these I have watched over from my youth. So he's been doing them. He's aware of them. And hearing this, Yahushua said to him, yet. Yeah, one you lack. He says, sell all that you have and distribute it to the poor. And you shall have treasures in the, in the Shemayim and come, follow me. But when he heard this, he became intensely sad for he was extremely rich. And Yahushua said, uh, saw that he became intensely sad and he said, how hard is it 
for those who have money to enter into the reign of Elohim. For it is easier for a camel to enter through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the reign of Elohim. For those who heard it said, and who is able to be saved? And he said, what is impossible with men is possible with Elohim. And Kepha said, see, we have left all and followed you. And he said to them, truly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or parent or brother or wife or children for the sake of the reign of Elohim, who shall not receive many times more in the present time. So now, and in the age to come, everlasting life. So he's covering it all here. He's telling us by condensing it all, it's very simple. You know, that we that we need to do, we need to have our minds changed and transformed and really look. We're living out much of this already. We're doing the commandments. You know, um, we've left or we've, we've, we've separated, we've departed or, 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 or have been put apart, if you will, from those of our house, our parents. We see that those that aren't following you who are with us, we're being separated. We're being divided from them. But it's for the sake of Elohim and his kingdom. But he, but he gives us a promise when we do these things that, you know, it's not going to be in vain. It's for a purpose. Praise Yah for that purpose. And for he, he's opening our eyes and our minds to be able to see no matter what he asks of you and I, we have to be in a position where we hear it and we receive it and we respond to it appropriately. We should be, as has been already spoken of by about Abraham and this story here, there should be absolutely nothing in this life that we should hold on to beyond Elohim. Nothing is more important to you and I than him, our relationship with him and, 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 and continuing to focus on what's going to get us to everlasting life. That's what this is about. So praise Yah. Ben and Jamie, what you got? Um, the, the last thing that I thought of was, it's kind of a correlation between what brother Dean said about, um, the account of Abraham and what you were saying, brother Rick, but specifically with the account about Abraham, what sticks out oh. to me is that it, I, I don't know that it was necessarily about considering Isaac, uh, Yitz, Yitzhak as a possession so much as did Abraham truly believe the covenant that the father made with him did he truly believe that he would make him a fruitful nation y Yitzhak was his only son I mean it was the only option that he had in his life at that moment and did he truly believe what the father promised him and that he was going to make his his seed greater than the sands I, I think the choice that we have to make every single day is do we believe the things that he's promised us and are those promises and is that covenant that we're making with him more important than the things in our lives i mean praise y'all for today's um lesson and for the input that all of our brothers and sisters have added it, it's been um really great and um i think the father is just reminding us the covenant and and the promises that he's made for us and every choice that we make leads to either eternal life or or judgment and every day we have to choose which not which every day we have to choose where we're going to put our effort and how we're going to live our lives and whether we're going to submit to him or not praise you what it boils down to. I see your hand there, Brother D. What you got now? Uh, just really short. Um, hallelujah. Um, so we, we, when we read about uh, Abraham, the response was, here I am. Um, in Exodus chapter 3, verse 4, And Yahuwah saw that he turned aside to see, and Elohim called to him from the midst of the bush and said to Moshe, 
and said, Moshe, Moshe, and he said, here I am. And then in Genesis chapter three, verse nine, and Yahuwah Elohim called unto Adam and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. So there seems to be a contrast in the way in which we respond and our response is directly correlated based on our level of faith. So, hallelujah. Here I am. Choose me. <laughs> you know, it makes you, uh, makes you, makes you wonder because you know that Yahuwah knew, you know, where he was. He wasn't, he wasn't calling out to him for, for, for him to find him. He was calling out for him to acknowledge that he was listening. Here I am. I hear you. You know, are you, are you, are you hearing though, that voice? Is he calling out to you? Is he, is he saying your name? You know, I think you have because you're here today. You know, you're, 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 you're seeking a better way of walking before him. These studies that we're doing are bringing us to a better revelation of what is required of you and I, you know, and make us think. If there comes a point, a moment in time that we're asked or told, I should say, or directed to do something, we should be willing to do it without question or without hesitation. Because some of the things that he may ask us to surrender may be in the same threshold, something that we're holding on as a treasure, something that we're putting before him, something that is of greater significance. You know, some people put a high priority on their, their money, you know, their, their, their assets, you know, um, a lot of people have taken their own lives because they've lost all of their assets. They've lost their hope for life. You know, we need to be in a position where, there's nothing holding a greater priority in our lives than Allahim. His word, you know, his, this life that he's living be, uh, through you and I, you know, the closest that we can have with him. Those are the treasures that we, that we should be looking to continue to build upon, to grow closer in our walk with him so that no matter what he asks of you and I, when he calls our name, we respond. And we move, we, we move in accordance to what he leads us to do. And it really shouldn't be anything that puts a pause or a hindrance on you and I. If he asks of us, you know, we should move. Uh, if there's a hesitation in that, then there's some examination that needs to take place, I believe, in our lives. Um, because this life should not hold any barrier to Yahuwah. There should be nothing in this life that's superior to him and what he wants to do with you and I. He wants us to, to gain eternal life. That's the, that's the desire of the Father. He wants to spend eternity with you and I. You know, Yahushua's made it very clear that that's his desire. He wants you to sit beside him on his throne. Take up that, a place, that position of authority within his kingdom. And to do so, this life you know, and the things that we possess in this life should have limited meaning to you and I. The things that really should matter is you and I, you know, our relationship with the body, you know, because that's where he brought us back to, you know, how we love one another and how we love him. And that comes down to our actions, our choices in this life, you know, the things that we choose to do and they, that we don't do. They all going to add up. So, you know, as we've been learning, you know, there's a lot of examining of ourselves that's required. You know, we have to continually look into our lives, our choices, our decisions to be able to see, are we, are we walking accordingly? And if we were called to this place and we asked Yahushua the same thing, what is required of us to have eternal life? And if he told you something that you needed to do, would you be willing to do it? Praise Yah for this study today. I appreciate all of your input because, you know, this takes it to another level of us opening our eyes and our minds to him and his word. What's he expecting from you and I? What's required of us? 
And that's what our goal is here to, to continue to walk in that way. Hallelujah. Praise Yah. May you who will continue to brock you and keep you and make his face shine upon you and give you his shalom. Shabbat shalom, everyone. It's time for our children's Shabbat. There's not going to be any announcements today. I hope you've all seen that. Mr. June? Shalom. Did you want to stop recording?